Hello from Garden of the Gods, the Visitor Nature Center in the city of Colorado Springs and the Parks Recreation and Cultural Services. My name is Brett Tennis, I'm the Parks Operations Administrator here at Garden of the Gods, and we wanted to share some of our uh, wildlife touch table items with you today. We're going to uh, talk a little bit about wildlife that you can see in the park, and then uh, maybe go into some of the specifics of these animals and how they live in our park. And so we're going to start with some of the most common sites that you can see uh, in the park. One of those is going to be our cottontail rabbit. We've got a nice fur here, uh, keeps the animals warm. Rabbits are, are pretty common all over the state, in other areas, in the garden, they're pretty common. Um, and you'll know it's a cottontail by the white tail that they have. Nice little fuzz ball that you're going to see at their tail. Um, and we actually have one on our exhibit over here. So you can see the whole animal and what that looks like. Right over here, a little bit of a winter coat going on that guy. And you can see these critters all over the park. They are out mostly at night, but they're definitely out in the daytime as well. Here at Garden of the Gods, we have over six million visitors a year. That's a lot of people. And that can have a big impact on wildlife. We definitely like to practice and preach leave no trace ethics here. And so we want everybody to respect wildlife. Give them distance if you see them. Animals like the rabbits are really used to people and they can allow you to get pretty close. But you never wanna get too close to the wildlife or feed them. You wanna keep them wild. Another common sight in Garden of the Gods is the mule deer. We got a little piece of their pelt here, the fur. Mule deer are known for their large ears and their fur keeps them really warm in the winter. They have a lot of this undercoat. Right here you can see a lot of the undercoat exposed and this covers the whole body and then they have longer guard hairs that you can see here. These hairs are filled with air. They're actually hollow and so that'll really, that's the best insulator for wildlife. If you want to see the deer, they're seen all over the park. They're a common sight, like I mentioned, but they like to hang out in the, the thick trees and the oak during the hot days. And so during the summertime here, you want to keep your eyes in the shadows and in the shade, a little bit away from the road. And that's pretty much the same for all the wildlife. We've got a few skull replicas here. So these are, these are plastic resins that look just like the real thing. A lot of people don't realize that mule deer don't have teeth on the top of their mouth. They do have the teeth on the bottom. You can tell that this is an herbivore by looking at the teeth here. These teeth are designed for plants. Munching, grinding up vegetation and snipping off the little buds and twigs at the end. They really like the new growth. Things like mountain mahogany. On the top of their roof of their mouth, it's, it's very similar to the feel of the sole on a tennis shoe. That kind of rubber feeling. It's pretty tough and that's really good for them to pinch onto branches and pull off leaves, nip off the tips of the new growth. That's the kind of food that they really like. The does are the females and the bucks are the males. And the bucks are going to grow the antlers. And the antlers are made of bone, pretty tough, and they shed so they fall off every year. Every year the animal has to grow back a new one. There's a little bit of an urban myth or legend that you can count the points to age the animal. That's just not really true. Uh, the size of the antlers, the amount of the points, it depends mostly on genetics, uh, available food source, how much is this animal able to eat and find, and uh, new growth just depends on the animal. When the animal gets really old, antler size can actually decrease. One of the advantages of growing antlers versus horns is that when this animal is fighting, he's trying to win over the ladies, um, defense, sometimes these antlers can get broken. An entire side can get broken off. And that's okay, the animal will grow a whole new one when it comes back the following year. Finding a shed on the ground, this is a shed 
that fell off naturally. And finding these on the ground can be quite a treat and a prize. Uh, but you do want to keep in account no trace. Uh, leaving antlers in the wild is very important. This is an antler that has been eaten all the way down to a nub by rodents, most likely. Lots of animals will, will feed and eat on these because it provides valuable minerals, calcium, and other nutrients. So it's, if you find an antler, you might want to really consider leaving it there to provide some food, some really scarce minerals for the rodents and other animals that need that to survive. Now another animal that you might see in the park is the coyote. Coyotes are seen in the park. Um, they're mostly nocturnal. They're coming out right at dusk, dawn. Um, they're not always seen everywhere in the park. Uh, along Camp Creek is a good place to see them. They've got a nice pelt and they come in a lot of different colors. This one is pretty dark. You can see some black in there. They can come very light, come in very red, different tones. They usually will have a black tip on the end of their tail and that's a good ID marker for a coyote versus something like a fox or even a domestic dog. You're going to see all those in the park as well. And this animal is going to be uh, eating both plants and meat, an omnivore, kind of like a human. You can see on the teeth here, a little bit wider in the back, helps to munch up some vegetation or fruit. Uh, definitely some big canines here to help with eating the meat, tearing that off. Very vocal animals, a lot of fun to hear them in the evenings. Uh, if you've never heard coyotes sing, it's a good sound. And sometimes I like to imitate that sound using a little mouth call. Little barks you can hear. Little barks you can hear or howls. A lot of fun to call and hear those guys in the evenings or in the early mornings. So keep your ears out when you're in the park exploring as well. We do have a coyote in the exhibit over here. You can see the whole full body on. And this is kind of a small coyote in this display. They can get fairly large. They're usually roaming around in packs, so at least two or more animals. This time of year, you're gonna have a family, the mom and pop uh, with this year's litter of pups. And they're gonna be teaching them and learning all kinds of tricks on how to survive in the park and looking for food and learning to live with people. So, so many people in the park, the coyotes are a little shy, but they definitely know that it's okay to walk around with most people. So you can see them in the daylight, um, usually just moving from one spot to another. Now another common sight that gets people really excited in the park is the Rocky Mountain Bighorn Sheep, our state mammal. And so here we've got uh, some skulls and some fur. Now these guys come into the park at random times. I've yet to figure out exactly what brings them into the park or when they come, you know, is it cold weather, warm weather? Uh, they're seen year round. If you know where parking lot number two is, as you look to the north, from that parking lot, or usually to your right, you're gonna see a ridge, it's full of boulders. These boulders are tan in color. It's actually called Dakota Ridge because it's Dakota sandstone up there. And that is the spot to look for the bighorn sheep. That's where they usually come down into the park and uh, do their people watching. They like to sit up there and just kind of watch the people coming and going in the park. Sometimes they'll make their way further down to White Rock or even all the way to Gray Rock. Uh, hopefully, if somebody doesn't disturb them, um, they usually come down further. Chances are people try to get that cell phone picture and they get a little too close and the sheep will end up leaving the entire park. So please respect the wildlife if they come in. Um, if you're seeing them from the road, make sure you're not stopping on the side of the road and creating what we call a ram jam because uh, that's unsafe for, for sheep and people. But they're a fun sight to see and they definitely come into the park so you want to keep your eyes open for them. Uh, they can blend in really well on that ridge side. This is a, a winter coat, so this is pretty thick. When they shed this, it's going to look a little, a little crazy with the chunks of fur falling off. Again, this is hollow hair, good insulator, long guard hairs, really close to the, the surface here is a dense fur that you can kind of see a little bit there if you're able to pick that up on the camera. Really keeps them warm. 
These guys are out in the daylight hours. They kind of match human activity in that regard. They're not out at night. They're, they're not out as much in the very early or very late evening of the day. But right there, you know, 9, 10 o'clock, they're out. They're looking for food. Um, this is a skull of one here. Give you an idea. Nice big horns. So this horn is different than an antler. So an antler is more like bone. This is, again, going to fall off as a shed, regrow every year, a horn stays with the animal its entire life. Now, if this was to break, then it's not gonna grow back. And the sheep will actually intentionally break the tips of their horns off. It's called brooming. And you can see as this growth occurs and it comes around, it starts to curl back up. Now, this is the eye, and the eye's looking out this way. Sometimes this horn can curl back and actually start to block the view and get in the way of the animal seeing. And so they will rub this on rocks and they will intentionally broom that off, breaking it so that they can see. And that's where genetics come into play. Sometimes a horn will grow and it'll flare out to the side and the animal can see and it doesn't need to broom it off so it won't break it. And you'll get a nice long full curl or more. Sometimes the horns grow in a little even tighter than this one, and then they'll start to block that view sooner. And so the animal will want to break that off a lot quicker. There's kind of a general rule. It's a little bit hard to do, but if you look at the details of the horn, you'll notice these dark bands, dark bands growing. And so you can count these dark bands to roughly age the animal. So during the winter, there's not as much food available and the animal is not growing as much horn. Then during the spring and summer, especially if it has good access to some good food, like the animals here at, Big, at the Garden of the Gods, a lot of growth can occur. You can count these rings to age an animal out. Sometimes on the edge, it's a little bit easier to see. Teeth are always the best way to age an animal. Again, an herbivore. Nice teeth for, for eating plants. This animal still has some sharp points, so it wasn't that old. But a lot of people recognize bighorn sheep for those classic battles. You know, a ram, two rams running 30 miles an hour at each other, colliding can create a big impact. And it's quite a sight to see if you're able to catch that. I have seen that in the Garden of the Gods, a lot of fun. And you would think that it would be solid bone that would allow the animal to be able to handle that kind of abuse. Well, we have an older skull here that we cut open so that you could see what the inside of that horn looks like. And it's actually not solid. It has all these kind of cavities that are filled with liquid that allow the animal to absorb and distribute that shock force when they are colliding. Really thick bone as well. Lots of heavy ligament attachment for a very strong neck. And that allows these animals to really run at each other and collide. Some of the other horns that we can show you. Uh, this is a horn from a young male bighorn sheep. This guy was probably a two-year-old. And you can see size-wise it's, it's a little smaller. And that's in comparison to an even smaller horn from a female. So both the boys and the girls will grow horns. And the ewes, as the females are called, uh, horns are a lot smaller, a lot thinner. And so from a distance out in the wild, it can be a little confusing whether you're looking at a young male or a female. Um, but the way they hold their head is a little different. A lot of times the, the males, the bucks with the deer, elk, bighorn sheep, because they have more weight on their heads, they tend to run with a higher head. You know? As they're, they're running, their noses go up and their chin is up. So even in the winter or uh, spring, if a deer doesn't have its antlers, you can recognize when they run away how they hold their head, if it's a boy or a girl. So a lot of times, for some people, you see wildlife every day. If you're lucky enough and you got mule deer in your front yard, in your neighborhood, and you're seeing them every day, well, start to look at the details. I would suggest that, um, ask yourself, are you seeing the same animal? Are you seeing older or younger animals? There's characteristics that you can see uh, that can help you to distinguish individuals as well as age or sex. And these kind of things can help uh, have, have more fun with the wildlife you see every day. For example, if we come back over to our, our mule deer here, we have a mount. 
and you can tell just from the body size that this is a younger animal. So things you would look at, antlers can be a clue, but they can be misleading. This is a typical four point, as we would say in Colorado. If you're out east, you might call that an eight point, um, but that varies. Here locally, we would say this is a four point buck. And this is kind of thin, so that thinness helps to see that it's a young animal. But what I really look at is the nose. So if you look at the nose, it's really straight. And that's typical of a younger animal. The face just has kind of a younger look to it. Older animals, they look a little bit worn, you know, just like we do. Uh, it gets, you have to develop an eye to see it. But the nose, where it's really straight here, older animals will always get this little notch in it. And that's the same for elk, bighorns, mule deer, lots of animals. They just look for that notch. So instead of being really straight, it would come up and down, and that can help you to tell. Things like a big pot belly, you know, a nice mature buck is going to get more of a belly. Like all of us good men as we age, we develop a pot belly. So we'll look for those kind of details. If you're seeing something routinely all the time and you're starting to notice you might be getting bored of seeing that because every wildlife encounter and viewing should be special and it is. Now another animal that is sometimes seen in the Garden of the Gods is a raccoon. The tail is a dead giveaway of what critter this is. Nice stripes there. This is a, another darker raccoon. Sometimes they, any color you see in this pelt now, you can see a raccoon in. Lighter, darker, and they are mostly nocturnal. So these guys are really coming out when it's dark, and that's why you don't see so many in the garden. You can catch them in the evenings or early mornings. Again, an omnivore eating both meat and plants and anything it can find, and the teeth would reflect that. Nice canines for some meat, wide molars in the back, mostly to eat plants. Pretty similar looking to human teeth in the back here. Sometimes you can just find a, a part of a skull out in the wild, and the details, like especially with the teeth, can give you lots of information to help figure out what it is that you found. Raccoons in the park are mostly seen on the west side of the park, kind of the southwest, closer to uh, where they might be able to get some water. The raccoons do like their water. It's kind of an urban myth that they, they like to wash their food. Um, they have very sensitive fingers, and what they really like to do is get those wet for more sensitivity. They probably don't mind cleaning up the food a little bit as well, but it's not their intention to go and wash their hands and food before they eat but they get more sensitivity with their hands when they're wet. And they like to be around water, so it kind of leads to that urban myth. Now another site, it's not quite common, but you know, we, it's probably one of the best areas to see bobcat. Bobcat are definitely in the park. And we had good sightings a few years ago. It seems like they're down a little bit, but they are out there. Now cats are notorious hard to to find. They, these guys blend in so well. The little tail is what lets you know it's a bobcat. And it always surprises me how much they move that tail around. They flick it and it wags and it's always moving. So keep an eye out for that. Nice spots on them also help to identify it as a bobcat. And they can come in gray or even as orange as this fox pelt that we'll get to. Bobcats are typically seen um, anywhere in the park, really, but you, you'll find them, you're able to spot them when they're out in the open on the edges of the tall grass and the bushes. Now these guys are carnivores. They are strict meat eaters, and now their teeth will reflect that. Nice sharp molars in the back for slicing meat and pinching off chunks to be able to, to eat. Very similar to a house cat in appearance. Uh, skulls are pretty similar as well. They got a little bit bigger claw to them there. Here's a bobcat claw that you can see. Hopefully that's going to come out okay on the camera. And they're retractable. And so when you're looking for sign like tracks, you're not going to see claws in cat tracks. Versus a coyote, well their claws are not retractable. And so you're going to be able to find the claw marks in those tracks. Another canine in the park are foxes. A red fox is a very rare sight. We have gray foxes in the park more often than red fox. Sometimes you'll see the red fox near the urban areas, 
um, but I, it's been a while since I've seen one. The white tip on the tail helps to identify that versus the coyote tail, which was black. Red foxes can come in black, silver, lots of colors, and they're very similar in size and appearance to the gray fox. And the gray fox is usually a little bit more shy, and they're gonna be seen on the west side of the park. A little bit smaller, a lot more gray in tone. These guys are omnivores, so they're gonna have a little bit wider part to their molars. They definitely prefer meat, and so they got a little bit more of the meat-eating teeth than they do the herbivore teeth, but they will eat a wide variety of food, just about anything they can find. Gray foxes are able to, to climb trees, and we've had uh, sightings of the gray fox up in the rocks in Garden of the Gods, sometimes hundreds of feet up on the rocks, climbing, and personally, I suspect that they're, they're probably looking for pigeon nests or other nests to raid. Um, you know, wherever they can climb and get to, they're gonna be looking for that food source. So keep your eyes open for foxes, mostly on the west side of the road. Rampart Range Road going into Pike National Forest on the west side is a, a good place to maybe catch a glimpse of those guys. Another critter that somehow we don't have problems with people harassing is a striped skunk. Skunks are in the park and they're, they're not commonly seen, mostly because they're so nocturnal. They're gonna be coming out when it's dark, at night, might catch glimpses of them in the early evenings or late. Um, anytime that the, the, it's starting to get dark, you might see a skunk. And it is possible to see them in the day as well. They can definitely be out walking around, uh, looking for grubs, digging in logs or other things. Um, and they're gonna be omnivores, eating plants and meat and a lot of insects as well. They got pretty good noses but definitely not a critter you wanna to get too close to. We have had sightings of spotted skunks in the park as well. I've never seen one, I'd love to see one in the park. So if anybody out there ever sees a spotted skunk, be sure to let us know. We're curious to see just how many are in the area. A lot more rare, but uh, native to the, to the local area in Colorado. Now another animal you might see, a little larger, is the black bear. Black bear are not living inside the park, but they certainly pass through the park, and there's a few that we suspect are living on the edges of the park. You can see them anywhere in the park. Um, mostly on the west side, they kind of tend to come in from Pike National Forest while they're looking for food. And as the residential and development grows around us, we're kind of losing sightings of these larger animals that come visit the park from Pike National Forest. That's uh, to the west of the park if you're not familiar with the area. Um, so I'm hoping that that doesn't continue, but uh, we'll see what the future brings. We have what's known as a wildlife corridor, this thin strip of land that allows animals from Pike National Forest to come visit the Garden of the Gods. And that's getting smaller and smaller all the time by development. Bears are, are well-known omnivores, a lot larger skull, larger teeth here, big molars, again, similar to us in appearance because they're gonna eat a lot of different plants. Um, they will eat meat as well, lots of grasses. They're a little bit more of an herbivore than a carnivore, but they certainly uh, prefer the meat because it's got a lot of protein and good nutrients to it. Big nasal cavity, these guys can really smell. When you're out in the wild, it's important to, if you're camping uh, to keep your food secure. If you're keeping it in your vehicle, you're kind of inviting a bear to come in, but that's better than keeping it in your tent. A lot of little practices like that. Come see us and learn more about Leave No Trace programming and tips on camping and living with bears. In the park, again, the bears are used to seeing people. Uh, there's a lot of excessive fear about bears. Um, you certainly don't want to surprise one. You never want to run from wildlife if you encounter one. Um, just let them know you're there. Most of the times, if a bear is in the park, it's used to seeing people, it's not going to be worried about you unless you're doing something you shouldn't be, like trying to approach it. You don't want to scream and make loud noises, startle a bear, or run away. Um, if a bear is, is kind of acting funny, it's not getting away from you when it first sees you, uh, then you want to stand still, uh, maybe slowly back away, look big. Again, don't scream, just talk to the bear. Like, 
Hey, bear, don't you know I'm a human? You don't want to come closer to me. And you just start talking. That's what I do. Usually if a bear's upset and it wants you gone, it's going to let you know. They can make some really strange sounds, noises, um, and you'll, you'll know that it's upset. They can pop and snap their teeth. They can do that so loud. It's just it's like, it's like clapping. It's a weird sound I can't mimic, um, but you'll definitely know it when you hear it. Now, another animal that kind of has a little fear from, from most people that we see in the park is the mountain lion. Mountain lions do visit the park. They are very rarely seen. I've never seen one in the park myself, uh, but we have had visitors sight them. They will come and visit and kind of check out the area. Um, here's a nice claw from a mountain lion. And again, this is a, a cat. And so this is a retractable claw. You're not gonna see that in the tracks. Now this guy's eaten mostly deer, rabbits, smaller animals. You can grab that so you can compare that to a bobcat claw. So a lot more going on there with the mountain lion. And again, you know, any animal in the park is gonna be used to people. They're not gonna be trying to, to hurt or interact with people. Most often, as soon as they know another person is around, they're gonna get out of that area. There's certain situations with all wildlife. That you, maybe you don't know that there's some, some babies nearby. Um, you know, it could be cornered, it could be an older animal that's hurting for food, and it's got a food source nearby that it's not willing to leave. These animals will usually give warning signs, but either way, you always want to keep your distance. If you're taking photographs, you know, use a telephoto lens. You've got to be staying on trail in Garden of the Gods, and if you get a chance to see one of these, enjoy the view. They're a rare sight. Another strict carnivore, so it's Skull is just basically a larger, thicker version of the bobcat. Sharp molars, sharp canines, all to help feed on, on meat and flesh. Powerful, strong animal. Rare sight, mostly seen kind of in the central garden area on the west side of the, the garden. Usually not seen anywhere on the east side of the park. Um, you gotta keep your eyes open for them. They blend in as soon as they stop. We do have a full mount up here as well to see what the whole body looks like. And this is a pretty small mountain lion um, for reference. Sometimes if you look really close, you might be able to see some spots. They're very faded spots. And that can help give you an idea of the animal's age. They have spots their first year of life. And that's while they're living with mom. And mom is going to be showing them the sights, teaching them how to hunt. That's usually when we see them in Garden of the Gods, is when a mother is showing usually a couple kittens or cubs around inside the park. And I think she's just showing them what's in the area, showing them a place where they can find some deer, and then uh, they don't stick around. You can see very faint spots on our mount here, as well as our pelt over here. I don't know if these will come out in the, the camera, they're very, very faint, but right here you can see some, some darker spots. And these are just the, the spots fading away. So this animal was probably around two years old. It unfortunately got hit by a car. It was crossing Highway 24 um, near Red Rock Open Space. And so this was an animal that lived and learned where the Garden of the Gods was, Pike National Forest, and Red Rock Canyon Open Space and unfortunately got hit by a car crossing the road there. A lot of these pelts, these animals lived in the park. Our black bear here, who we nicknamed Beatrice, um, she was hit by a car by Balanced Rock. And this bear got in the habit of raiding trash cans and hanging out near the road, or possibly was being fed, we don't really know. Um, but this was a bear that got associated people and food, and that's never a good thing for wildlife. Unfortunately, it, it got hit by a car um, all these pellets have stories. If you come see us at Garden of the Gods, we'd love to share more information with you, more details about the specific animals that share the park with us and you. I hope you've enjoyed spending some time with me, and I hope we can teach you some more. Thank you.